Hi, welcome to Inside Church. We're so glad that you are able to join us. We trust that as you watch the message that your heart will be stirred and that faith will be built. Thank you so much, Pastor Joshua. Can you give your leaders here a big round of applause? Thank you, Pastor Joshua. Thank you, Caleb and the team and everybody who works so diligently. I honor you all uh, and I thank God for this opportunity. I never count it lightly uh, to come and minister to God's people. I know we have relationship and um, me and my family, we have a long and good history with the Watson family, but this is more than coincidence. This is more than just a product of relationship. This is actually God's divine design that I'm here this morning because he wants you to hear a specific word and a specific message to help accelerate you to the next level, into the next season. And I'm so glad to do it. Can we just pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come before your people. I thank you, Father, that you would think through my mind and speak through my lips, that this word of God would come out unhindered and unchecked by any outside force, that the seed of this word would go into every heart and bear forth much good fruit. Now, Lord, I decrease that you increase. I step back that you may step forward, and we decree and declare in advance signs, wonders, and miracles confirming the word preached here today. We call it done by faith in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, team. I appreciate you all. Give them a round of applause. (laughs) Phenomenal, phenomenal job. You know, there's such a hunger here in this church, and it's so refreshing. Every time I come, and I've been coming, oh, maybe for, you know, four years now or, or so, but every time I come, it's like there's a deeper and deeper and deeper hunger. And that's what we want as a church. We want to be hungry for God, hungry for Jesus, hungry to do the mission, and hungry to worship and serve Him. And you can feel that in the atmosphere, and I think that's what makes my experience here always so powerful. I mean, it refreshes me and encourages me every time I have a chance to come and minister to you all. And so I think, um, you know, things have been going well because I've always ministered in youth service, but I've been promoted today. Uh, Not that it is any lower to minister to the youth. I believe that that's actually a very specific and special assignment. But uh, I've been promoted to Sunday morning, so hello, everybody. It's good to see you. And uh, and if you're not familiar with me, uh, I am the International Director of Bill Winston Ministries, serving under my father, Dr. Bill Winston, who's actually at Durban Christian Center right now ministering the gospel. And uh, we've been um, coming to South Africa. Well, I've been coming to South Africa, I think, for about 11 years now. But he's been coming to South Africa for 25 years. Praise God. And, uh, and so we were here doing the um, International Kingdom Conference sponsored by Bill Winston Ministries Africa. We've had a great time. I actually started my journey in Cape Town, uh, let's see, the Saturday of last week, and then ministered there and then met up with the team in Kenya. And then from Kenya, we went to Tanzania and then back here to Durban. So when I went to Cape Town, I flew 27 hours and I've gone through multiple countries and have come to you. And you're worth it. Amen. Amen. You're worth it. I believe God saved the best for last here at Inside Church. Amen. Yeah. And uh, so I'm so grateful. And I came here to deliver a very simple word to remind you of how special you are, just how significant you are to the plan of God. I remember back in 2009 when I first started in ministry, I started in pastoral ministry, and oh, let me do this, let me, uh, let me set my timer so I know where I'm at, because you know how the saying goes, he who is not long-winded will be invited back. So, um, but I started in ministry in 2009, I didn't want to go into full-time ministry, as a matter of fact, I didn't want to be a pastor at all. Not that I saw anything wrong with pastoral ministry. I just thought that Bill and Veronica Winston were doing such a good job at it that God didn't need another Winston doing the same thing. So I said, Mom and Dad, that's for you. I wanted to be a cardiologist, a heart surgeon. And um, I went through most of college pursuing that. And I got to my senior year at uh, the university there, uh, or Roberts University, which uh, Sarah Lee, she has, I believe, graduated from now and so um, in the States. And so... 
uh, I got to my senior year, and God spoke to my heart and said, God, uh, he said, David, I've called you into full-time ministry. And I said, well, well what do you mean, Lord? I, I really feel like my entire life, since I was a young kid, I felt like I was called to be a cardiologist, a heart surgeon. And God said that you've correctly discerned the call, but you've misunderstood what it meant. He said, I've called you to be a spiritual heart surgeon, to do spiritual heart surgery, to mend the brokenhearted. I said, oh, Lord, how could I miss it? You know, people, people would want to prophesy all the time, Josh, about how I'm supposed to go into full-time ministry, and I wouldn't want to hear it. They said that they were prophesying. I said, no, you are prophesying. <laughs> no, thank you. But God knew the plan that He had for me, and He had good plans for me. And uh, so I submitted to that call and did some grad school um, and some seminary and then moved back to Chicago with my wife and my two boys in 2009. And in September 2009, I preached my very first service, my very first message at our youth ministry, Go Heart for Christ Youth Ministry. And I remember standing at a podium just like this, and Pastor Josh, I stood in a full suit and tie at the youth service. Kids were in shorts and t-shirts and stuff, and here I am in my full suit and tie. And the only reason I did that is because I was used to my father dressing like that. That's all I knew. That's all I knew. So... As cute and endearing as it was, I stood up there with my suit and tie, I read my notes, I read the scriptures, notes and scriptures I might have looked up three times. I was so nervous. You might have done something before that you've been very nervous. They say public speaking can be one of the most intimidating things you can do in life. And so I did it. I didn't know how it was going, but when we did the altar call and the call to action, there was such a large response it was so overwhelming. I was so blessed. It was like, it happened so quickly. It happened in a blur. But the most important thing was that people responded to the message of Jesus. And in that moment, I realized something. That in my weakness, he is truly strong. I realized something, and that's why I pray this every time I get up on stage. I pray that they not see me, but they see him that I decrease, that he increases, and that I step back so that he can step forward. Because every time I stand on a platform, I remember that first message. I remember how deficient I thought I was. I said, I'm not good, a good public speaker. I'm not trained in this. I, I'm not excellent or experienced in this. But God, I'm going to trust you. And how many times do we know that God just asks us to trust him? Even beyond how you feel like you're equipped or trained or how you feel like you've been experienced in the past, he just asks you to trust him and just take the first step. And so I remember not long after that, maybe a year after that, I've been preaching a little bit more, and Dad called me one day, and he said, hey, I'm going to be out this coming Wednesday. I need you to preach at the main sanctuary. I need you to preach the main message. And I tried to convince my dad that that wasn't a good idea. I said, Dad, I don't, I, you know, I don't think that that's a good idea. You know, I'm in the middle of a teaching topic, but it's very specific to youth. I don't know how it's going to translate. And he rebuked the spirit of fear and then told me that I didn't have an option and uh, didn't have a choice. I'm so thankful for a faith-filled father who pushed me towards something that I didn't feel like I could do in my own strength. God is a good father. And sometimes we feel like he's pushing us toward our demise, like almost like he's pushing us towards something to our detriment, but really he's pushing us towards something to expose something greater inside of us. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I went and I ministered that message, and, and it went well or so I was told, and even to this day, people remember it because it left such a mark on them. And I'm telling you all this to tell you, that even in the midst of that, I was still trying to find my own voice. In the first several years of ministry, I struggled to find my own voice, my own unique voice. I, I always wondered, like, you know, am I being too serious? Should I be funnier? Am I being too funny and too laid back? Should I be more serious? Should I dress up more like my father? Or should I dress down more? Should I make more jokes? Or, or should I be more professional? When I took over Bill Winston Ministries, which was a total surprise to me, I thought I was coming to take over the youth ministry, but he said, surprise, Bill Winston Ministries. I was like, ah, I don't know if that's a good idea. 
Because I don't have a degree in organizational leadership, strategic management. I don't have a degree in any of that. But dad said, no, no, this is what God has spoken. And now I have to lead people who are old enough to be my parents and my grandparents. I was 24 years old when I took over that ministry. And I'm trying to figure out what the heck am I doing? And I remember going through and trying to figure out, like, how should I be? Trying to become more comfortable in my skin. And then looking to my dad and feeling like he's done such great things and still doing such great things for God. I mean, things that are talked about all over the world. I mean, bought malls and started banks and and done this and done that and, and making such an impact all over the globe for God's kingdom. I said, God, how can I ever live up to that? He said, you never have to. People used to say, how does it feel to have to fill your father's shoes? And I used to feel the weight of that. I said, "Uh, I don't know, kind of intimidating. But God said, you don't have to walk in his shoes. You walk in your shoes. You just continue to follow in his footsteps. You stand on his shoulders and continue in the legacy of faith. But you don't continue on being him. You continue on by being you. And the biggest impact that you'll make on the world will come only through being who God has called you to be. Not who God has called your parents to be, your friends to be, your mentors to be. All those people are good. Your pastor to be. All those people are great and inspiring. We learn from them. We're encouraged by them. We're taught by them. But God simply calls us to be us. Don't we all have these kind of same questions to answer about who God created us to be? That we have to trust that God chose the right person for the assignment, to know that we have what it takes to fulfill the plan of God. It it reminds me of a scripture found in John chapter 15, verse 16, and I'm going to read out of the New Living, or excuse me, New King James Version. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Say, I've been chose. Turn to your neighbor, say, I've been chose. Turn to your other neighbor, the good-looking one, say, I've been chose. (laughs) But I chose you. Husbands, don't get in trouble. Make sure to look at your wife when I say, look at the good-looking one. (laughs) Just, Just look right over the same direction. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I want you to write this down if you're writing notes, if you're typing notes, or if you're not, just lock it in a long-term memory. You are God's best candidate and first choice for the purpose He's called you to. You are God's best candidate and first choice for the purpose He's called you to. You're the best candidate. Sometimes we think that maybe it's other people who can do it better. Let's leave it to them. Let's leave the opportunity to them. Let's leave the starting of the business, the starting of the church, the going to the university, the doing this, the doing that. Let's leave it to those better people. But no, you are God's best choice for the purpose and assignment he's called you to. As a matter of fact, God is counting on you to get the job done. And so my personal journey of discovery, it actually prompted a command from God to write uh, my latest book, my new book that I just came out with called Authentic, The Confidence to Be Yourself, The Courage to Release Your Greatness. And today I want to talk to you about the courage to be great. I'm going to minister about the courage to be great. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 in the Amplified Bible. Turn with me there if you have your Bibles here today or if you have your Bible app. You know, we have no excuse, Pastor Joshua, nowadays. We got the Bible app. We got, you know, Bibles in our hand. You know, you got Bible any way you want it. The only way to not have the Bible is you don't want it. But that's not you. That's, that's them out there, but not you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. I'll say this. If you don't have the Bible app on your phone, get a Bible app on your phone. Really? I mean, you know, God commands us to read His Word, and for good reason. Our, the title of, or the name of our youth ministry is called Go Hard for Christ Youth Ministry. But one speaker came and said, how are you going to go hard for Christ and you don't know what He said? You don't know what He says. Well, we want to know what God says. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 in the Amplified 
This is the Apostle Paul. He writes this, For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined and planned beforehand for us, taking the paths which He had prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life. Say good life. Living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. But notice this. Living the good life is contingent upon knowing that we are His masterpiece. We are His workmanship. That word workmanship, it actually translates masterpiece, work of art, crowning artistic achievement, one of a kind, that there's only one of you in the entire earth, and that's incredibly valuable. You're incredibly rare. And sometimes we live life thinking that maybe we're deficient or we wish we were somebody else or like somebody else, but God says, no, no, I've created you on purpose for the purpose to which he's created you. Your personality is perfectly suited for the purpose that he's given you. As a matter of fact, the more you understand who and how you are, I believe that purpose starts to find you. But a lot of times if we shrink back, if we cower, if we try to hide who we are, we try to downplay our significance, our difference, I like to call it our unique genius, then it makes it difficult to walk the path of purpose because we're trying to find it. We're so, where, well, where is it? Where is it? And a lot of times people are asking when it comes to purpose, they ask the question of what instead of asking the question who. And they try to do it backwards. They're asking, like, what to do? They look at something tactical, right? What are the to-dos? What should I be doing? But I say, no, 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 step back. Let's look at it from this perspective. Who are you? Who are you? Who has God created you to be? Because if we can understand who you are and you can start to walk in that, then what you need to do will become clearer and much easier to understand. Can we keep going? You guys can talk back to me this morning. Can we keep going? Yes. yes, all right. We're here to have some fun. There are some things that God wants you to do to advance His kingdom, but you will be reluctant to do them if you don't think you're the right person for the job. And now in the Bible, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see a young man who saved a whole nation. It was a teenage boy because they didn't divert from the plan of God. He didn't divert from being who God called him to be. I'm talking about David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see that he was a young boy, a shepherd boy. He was taking care of his father's sheep. He was a musician. And as I said, he was a shepherd. And he was young. He wasn't a trained warrior to do battle, or so we thought. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet Samuel, he comes to the house of Jesse because it's time to anoint the next king. God's hand was leaving Saul, and it was time to anoint the next king. So Samuel comes, walks up, knocks on the door. Jesse says, hey, prophet, come on in. What's up, man? Can I get you some coffee? You all have some fantastic coffee over here, by the way. Mm, it warmed my soul. And so he comes in, and he says, it's time to anoint the next king. God has sent me here. Put all your sons right here so I can see what the Lord says. And so Jesse says, oh, okay, Samuel, no problem. Come on in, boys. Come on in. Had them lined up. And I can see Samuel. He's kind of going down the line. And I can see him starting with the tall, handsome, strong, good-looking one first. You know, kind of like me. I understand. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And so he's starting with this one. Said, and God said, no, that's not him. And he goes down the line. No, that's not him. And goes down the line. No, that's not him. And keeps going. He's seven sons in, and he gets to the last son and said, Jesse, now I know I can hear the voice of God. Where, where is he? There's, is there, do you have any more sons? And he says, well, I got another boy. But he's out there keeping sheep. You don't, you don't, you don't want him. He says, no, no, call him in. And notice his father didn't even think enough about him to call him into the house. He didn't even think that he was the most likely candidate. As a matter of fact, he thought that he was such an unlikely choice that he didn't even bother to call him into the house. And he brought David into the house, 
And God said to Samuel, don't look on the exterior appearance or the outward appearance because I look at the heart. And God said, this is him. And I could see Samuel saying, God, are you sure? No, no, this is him. And so he anoints him with oil and anoints the next king. And what does David do? Does he change his bio on his Instagram account to next king? <laughs> Little crown emoji right there? No, no. He didn't do any of that. He went right back to the field to continue in his assignment. Because it wasn't time for him to be announced yet. See, you can be anointed but not announced. But it doesn't discount the anointing on your life. Somebody might feel like you're in a waiting season. You feel like there's an anointing on you. But God says, just be patient and just be faithful. I'm going to get to that in just a second. But so we see David goes back to the sheep. But then we see in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 4, there's a giant-sized problem that happens. This is a very familiar story, David and Goliath. So there was this man named Goliath, and I'll read the fourth verse. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So some historians estimate he was about nine or ten feet tall. I would say that that's a giant, right? And in verse 10 it says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were scared, or what we say in America, scared. They were scared. And in verse 16, it says this, And the Philistine drew near and presented himself for 40 days, morning and evening. So let's fast forward through the story. So David comes to bring some Nandos to his brothers. Jesse said, bring some food. So he picked up some Nandos and brought it to his brothers. They were hungry. And you thought his brothers would be happy to see him. Like, oh, it's time to eat. We're hungry. We've been on the battlefield all day. But his brothers said, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Go away. As a matter of fact, who's keeping the sheep? If you hear, who's there? So he said, well, what have I done now? I'm just here to bring some food. Dad said, bring y'all some food. So that's what I'm doing. But he overhears Goliath taunting them, taunting their God. And he says, do y'all hear that? Can you hear that? You know he's talking about us, right? And I can see his brothers getting more and more angry. David, go away. We'll handle this. They said, no, no, no. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the Almighty God? And then he starts inquiring, right, because David's a little nosy. He says, well, what will I get if I were to perhaps step up and try to defeat and fight this giant? And they you entertain him, and they tell him, you know, what would happen. And then David says, well, hmm, maybe this might be a good idea. And I can see his brothers trying to kick him out, try to get him to leave. But notice the battle is calling out to David. I feel like it's really important that when we go through life, when there's things that are stirred in our hearts, there's things that are calling out to us, battles, if you will, calling out to us, maybe things that we see on the news or in society and culture that keep coming up in our prayer time or, or really bother us, and we feel like, hey, somebody should solve this problem. You know what? God is about to solve the problem. He solves it through you. That's why He won't let you forget about it. That's why it bothers you so much when you see it. Because when God solves problems, he anoints people. Sometimes we want God to solve problems through other people or solve problems because he's sovereign. So you don't need to use and need anybody, God. You can just do it yourself. Or maybe we look to politicians, right, and the leaders of the land. But you're a walk walking problem solver. You've been appointed and chosen to solve the problems of this world. And you are a solution, walking around in skin. And people may not know that you are the one to solve that problem, but God, he's answering the prayer through you. 
So let's keep going. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, then David said to Saul, because Saul called him in, he heard about David wanting to fight this giant and this Goliath. And then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him, or no, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, your boy David, will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Now, I can see King Saul, he's thinking, hey, this is crazy. Why would you come out and try to fight this Goliath? Can't you see that you are but a boy and that he's a giant? He's been trained in war, trained in battle. He's been fighting for many years. This is crazy. And David says, no, no, let me have a crack at him. And I want to talk to you about three things that we can learn from David's experience. I want to keep going in the scripture in verse 38. So Saul, he couldn't convince him not to fight. So he did what a good king would do. Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head, so he clothed him, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And then he took his staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch that he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now David was asked, not asked, he was probably told by Saul, here, let me give you my armor. But the Bible said that Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was tall. I like to think of him as like a LeBron James type figure. He was probably just a big guy, tall guy. So their armor is often custom designed for them. So if he was a big guy, tall guy, then his armor was going to be big. His shield was going to be big, his breastplate, his sword was going to be big and heavy. Now imagine David, a smaller boy, trying to put on this big old armor. And he's trying to walk around with it and got this big sword. And he's saying, King, I I can't use this. I haven't tested this. As a matter of fact, this doesn't even fit me. And then he pulled out exactly what he knew. He pulled out a sling. And I can imagine David with a sword in one hand and the sling in the other. He said, I got this sword, the piece of equipment that makes sense for this battle. But then I got this sling the piece of equipment I've always used. I've got the thing that I don't know anything about, but I got the thing that I know a lot about. I got this one sword, this thing I've never used, but then on the other hand, I've got this thing I've always used. I've got the thing that makes sense, but then I got the thing that, really, I know it takes courage, but the thing I have the most faith in. And I know God is going to be with me to fight this battle, but I want to choose the right equipment because I know this can mean life or death. So he put down the sword, the thing that Saul was trying to equip him with, to go with the thing that he had already been equipped with. See, oftentimes in life, people around us, even with their good intentions, they may try to equip us for our assignment the way that they think we should be equipped. Oh, you need to do this or get this job or go to this university or do this or go on this path. And, you know, they have good intentions, not to say that they're always wrong, but that's the way that man tries to equip. But then there's something that God has placed inside of you, that he's already pre-equipped you for the battle. That he's given you everything you need, which teaches me my first lesson from this story. All you have is all you need. That you have something inside of you, and you may feel like, God, but this is all I have. And he says, I know, that's all I'm counting on. That's all you need. Because once he went out to the battlefield, he's got this sling, and he's got these stones. And he starts putting it in the pouch and starts winding it up. 
And as he's winding it up, as I've studied, you know, the chosen weapon of choice for um, shepherds who had to fend off animals such as lions and bears, as David said, the chosen weapon of choice wasn't a machine gun. It wasn't even necessarily a sword. It was actually a sling, a sling and stone. As a matter of fact, some of these men who could use sling and stones really well, they called them slingers. And they got so good at using a slingshot and a stone that they could hit a bird in mid-flight. They could hit a target 200 meters away. And those stones that he got, I think they were like barium sulfide or something like that, but they were twice the density of normal stones. And a lot of times these slingers could sling stones more than 100 miles per hour. What is like like 160 kilometers per hour? I was pretty good at math in school. (laughs) And imagine how fast that's going. It has the stopping power of a 45 millimeter handgun. And the Bible says that when he launched the stone, it sunk into Goliath's head. It didn't just hit it and fall to the ground. It sunk in. Now, I know David might have had angelic help with that and supernatural help with that. But I'm here to make a point that when he stepped up to the battlefield, I could see the soldiers. I could see his brothers mocking him like, okay, our brother's about to get himself killed. Say goodbye. Because this fool has come out to the battlefield with this sling and these stones like he's about to protect some sheep. (laughs) But once you know that David had exactly what was necessary to win the battle, God was counting on him using what he had to win the battle. See, courage is not about, let me say it this way, courage to be great is about being who God has called you to be in the middle of adversity. Keeping your integrity. Standing up in faith. Standing up to demonic systems and tearing down strongholds. Changing culture and industry. Being a light in the darkness. Now notice, nobody asked David to do it. He volunteered for this. And God's not going to force you into his plan. He's not going to force you to solve the problems that we're facing in society. But he's going to put a stirring in your heart and see who will step up to the battle. And David didn't have to change what he's been doing. He just did what he had been practicing doing right in the pasture. But notice, which leads me to my second point, being faithful in obscurity will lead to victory publicly. Being faithful in obscurity will lead to victory publicly. See, while he was out there in that field taking care of that sheep, and taking care of those sheep. He wasn't just wasting time. Now, I know he was a harp player, and so he was probably leaning back, playing the harp sometimes, but he had to protect them because it said that he defeated a lion and a bear. He had to keep these sheep in order. He had to make sure that they didn't stray. He had to practice protecting those who may not be able to protect themselves, who were in harm's way. And notice that when he got to the battlefield, and he heard Goliath, something rose up in him. Not to do something brand new, but to practice what he had already been doing. He said, these people need to be taken care of. They need to be protected. They're vulnerable. And now he was forced to practice what he had been doing in obscurity on a bigger platform, on a higher stage. How many of us, we want opportunities. We're looking for God to expose us to the world, to promote us, to to bring us to prominence. But God says, I just want you to transfer what you've been doing in obscurity to a bigger platform and bigger stage. But the way you make yourself a candidate for promotion is faithfulness. Will you be faithful in the small things? Will you be faithful to take care of the sheep? Because when I give you the opportunity to step up and be great, I need you to do the same thing you were doing in obscurity. I learned how to take care of God's house, not by preaching messages, but by cleaning the church and vacuuming the pulpit. That was my first job when I was 15 years old. True story. I was vacuuming the very stage that I now preach from. And God was training something in me even that that long ago. He was preparing me and teaching me how to serve his house 
serve his people. I remember many days I vacuumed the entire sanctuary. We had a pretty big sanctuary. It would take three or four hours, but making it suitable to prepare a right environment for people to come and receive the Word of God. He taught me that with a vacuum in the middle of the sanctuary, not with a mic on the platform. Don't forsake what God has you doing in obscurity, in the small stages, in the behind the back, behind the scenes, in the back room, serving here, doing this. Don't despise small beginnings, as the Bible says, because your latter end shall greatly increase. I believe that God won't call you to the battle unless he's anointed you for it. I don't know what your battle is, though. Maybe it's starting a company, a ministry, or organization. Maybe it's going to university and getting an advanced degree. Maybe it's leading a small group or getting married or becoming a parent. I don't know what it is. But I do know this, and this brings me to my third point. God chose the right person for the assignment. Let me say that again. God chose the right person for the assignment. One more time, God has chosen the right person for the assignment. You could have been born at any point in history, 1818, 1949, 1513. Thank God I wasn't born in 1513. No Wi-Fi, no electricity, no, no indoor plumbing. I mean, that would have been rough. And of course, if you were born back then, you didn't know any better. But uh, thank God for our modern advancements and thank God for toilets. So, <laughs> but you could have been born at any time in history, but God chose this time. But the question is not so much when, but why. Why? Why now? Why did God choose now? As a matter of fact, I believe that God held out and held the best for last. That you could have been born for thousands of years prior to this, but God chose now to put you in the earth, to plant you here in Durban for a reason, for a purpose. Your life is not an accident. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. It is divine design. One person said that there is a 1 in 18 billion chance that you would have been placed in the earth in this location in this time in history. That is a calculated decision. You are a calculated decision from the God of the universe. And I had to learn this, Pastor Joshua. I had to learn this. I had to learn that there's a level of significance I carry. Way beyond my name or who I am or or my father who I serve, there's a level of significance that I carry just by being born and then having a father who's the God of the universe. He says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It says, marvelous are your works, Psalms chapter 139 and verse 14, and that my soul knows very well. You're unique. And God didn't get it wrong when it came to creating you. He created you on purpose. Now, here's what I've learned. That in order for greatness to be exposed, it needs a force. It needs a little push. It says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says this, Now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly, say exceedingly, exceedingly. abundantly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So notice that the Holy Spirit power, it's at work in us to do more than we feel like we can do that there is an exceedingly and abundantly that we are capable of that we may not consciously be aware of. But there is more than that you can do than you think you can do. There's a level that you can go to that you don't necessarily know you can go to or possibly even think you can go to. Or let me go a step further, a level that you don't even think is possibly for you. Maybe because of who you are where you're from, what family you were born into. Sometimes we think that because of maybe we don't have the right connections or the right amount of money in the bank account or didn't have the right schooling or didn't come through the right organization or or don't have the right other natural things, we feel like, oh, God can't use me in this kind of major way. 
But God, he doesn't need any of that. We talk, we're talking about God of the universe. He is not limited to our natural experience. What matters is not what's out here. What matters is what's in here and what's in here. It's about what you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it brought me to an example, and I feel like we can learn from David. Because as David stepped up to the battlefield, he might have already had in mind, you know, what he was going to do. But he stepped up to the battlefield. And as he stepped up to the battlefield, and as everybody was looking on, saying, man, this this kid is crazy. He's about to get himself killed. I believe that David knew something that nobody else did. I think he knew something. I think he knew what he was going to do, and it wasn't necessarily a surprise to him. And he knew that he was about to sling a stone with a sling. And everybody else thought this kid is going to die because Goliath is going to cut his head off real plain and simple. He doesn't even have any armor on. But David knew that he was never even going to get anywhere remotely close to Goliath. He was never going to get close to the giant. He doesn't have to be, well, within even maybe 40 meters to sling this stone. Maybe he can even be further. He doesn't have to step up and do hand-to-hand combat. So I really believe that he knew that he had a good chance of victory. If I know I'm about to fight this Goliath who's really good at hand-to-hand combat, but he's not about to come anywhere close to me, unless he can fly like Superman, I'm okay. I'm not coming anywhere close. As a matter of fact, I think we can see David's confidence in which he stated, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and the birds of the air will be feeding on your carcass. That doesn't sound like a young man who's scared. He was not intimidated. But it did take courage to step up to the battlefield. And a lot of times, God asks us to take courage and step up to the battle. He's equipped us inside with the ability, the talent, the gifts, the personality. I like to call it your unique genius. He's equipped you with the right things inside to do what you need to do and what he's asked you to do out here. But it'll bring us to these situations a lot of times that we feel like we can't handle on our own, right? We can't handle in our own wisdom, in our own knowledge, in our own experience and education, in our own strength. But then he asks us to take courage. And this ability that's inside that we don't know is there is called hidden ability. Another word for it is potential. It's hidden greatness, concealed greatness. One man calls potential unused success. And what I have here now, and I went to the township schools, and I asked, what is this? And they said, Colgate. (laughs) I said, okay, close enough. (laughs) Technically, it's Aquafresh, but (laughs) this is toothpaste. We'll go with Colgate, though. And there's toothpaste in here. I can see it. But the toothpaste doesn't just come out just by putting it upside down. How many of us used Colgate or toothpaste this morning? Yeah, amen. Some of you are are hesitant to say yes. (laughs) There's toothpaste in here, but I like to say potential is like toothpaste. It doesn't just fall out. It has to be squeezed out. It needs an external force or pressure to be applied. And a lot of times, God will put us in situations that maybe we feel like we can't handle in our own strength. And we'll say, God, deliver me out of this. And God will say, no, 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 I have to leave you in this because you have to be exposed. Your greatness has to be pushed out. Your potential has to be unleashed. They have to see that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They have to see that you can do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think. So what happens? You're given a new job assignment at work that goes far beyond your experience. You're given a promotion. You start a new business. You start a ministry or organization. You take over an existing ministry as a second generation leader. And God puts you in a situation you feel like, God, this is more than I can handle. And he said, yeah, I'm counting on it. Because in your weakness, I am strong. 
My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So God always puts us in situations that forces us to depend on him. And in the middle of depending on him, we learn about us. And potential starts to come out. Hidden ability. And you say, I didn't know I could do this. You want me to lead worship? I, I, I barely know the songs. But then you start leading worship and the spirit of God starts coming out. God says, go to school. And you say, how do I go to school? Like, I know how to go to school. I know how to get there. But, but I, I'm not a really great student. But God is saying, go to university. And you follow God and God starts doing great things. You make great connections. It's not only about the academics, but you meet some great professors who start setting you up for a certain field to go into. Oh, man. And potential, it starts coming out. It starts coming out. And then God says, hey, time to get married and start a family. You say, well, I like the get married part, but I don't know about starting a family because I didn't have a good mother or father example growing up. I don't know if I could be a good mother or father. But then you have a child and you'll see potential starts coming out. God is a good father because two things, three things actually. He provides for us, but he forces us to be in positions and stay in situations that develop us. And then he remembers, or helps us remember rather, that you're never alone, that I'm with you through it all. I'm going to put you in situations to depend on me, and then I'm going to prove my faithfulness to you while you discover who you really are and what you're really capable of. Praise God. I'm going to give the Colgate to Pastor Josh. Let me finish up with this. David always had the potential to do great things, but he just had to have the courage. But what I've noticed sometimes, friends, is sometimes we can be too addicted to comfort. Now, we don't want to risk being uncomfortable. We don't want to risk being exposed. Maybe we don't want to risk rejection. Maybe we have fear of rejection. Maybe we don't, we don't want to risk a fear of failure. Maybe you did something, started something, got into something, and maybe you feel like it failed. Maybe it ended abruptly because of COVID, or, or maybe you had to make a quick shift, a transition, and you're starting to feel ashamed, but God says He is faithful. And even when we are faithless, He is still faithful. That the end is not a good time to sulk, to feel bad about ourselves, but the end is a good time to start again and begin again with new wisdom and new strength and new strategy. My dad said this one time, Josh. He said, wisdom is expensive. Wisdom can be expensive. There's no failure in the kingdom. There's only learning. There's only learning. And when we stick with God and we hold him to his promise, it says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. We can never fail as God's people. If you feel like you're failing, it's only temporary. It's just one chapter. Keep reading to the end of the book. Our life is a story. It's a whole book. Don't get caught up in chapter 6. If the chapter needs to end, end it and start the next one. And allow God to be faithful. I hear God saying, give me a chance to be faithful. When we give up, we don't give God a chance to prove his faithfulness. But when we stay in faith, we see God's faithfulness. Releasing your potential means getting out of your comfort zone. Until pressure is applied, your potential remains hidden even from you. Pressure releases greatness. Pressure releases greatness. The courage to release your greatness is about the ability to withstand the force of the struggle that forces you to become better, or can we say it this way, it forces you to become greater. Who am I talking to in here that is going through something that is forcing them to become greater, forcing them to become better, 
forcing them to go up higher, forcing them to continue to put their faith and trust and hope in the Most High God. The demand or pressure on your potential, it may come from school or a job or an assignment or a leadership position or a promotion or the birth of a new organization or ministry or business or volunteering or writing a book or creating art or writing a song or getting married, becoming a parent. These things may force us to become better, but potential, remember, is really hidden greatness waiting to be exposed. Jesus said this, John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works, say greater, and greater works than these will he do, because I will go to my Father. You are expected to do greater works. You're expected to do greater things because the greater one lives inside of you. So if you're expected to do greater works, if the greater one lives inside of you, if you're made in God's image and likeness, that I present to you that greatness must be inside of you. There's greatness inside of each and every one of you. And if I've flown 27 miles, 27 miles, 27 hours, for one thing, I would boil it down to this. As a child of God, you were born to be great. You were born to be great. You weren't born to go through school, get a good job, have a family, and die. You were not born normal. You were not born to live regular. You were born to be great to do something great. I'm not talking about being famous. Martin Luther King, who was famous over in the States, you might have heard of him before, but he ended, uh, segre- he helped to end segregation through the civil rights movement back in the 1960s, 60s, and he said this, not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great because greatness is determined by service. What service am I talking about? I'm talking about serving the world, your gift, your ability, what's inside of you, your unique genius. And when you serve the world, your gift, that is greatness being exposed. My friend, you were born to be great, but it takes courage. But I believe you're the right people because you have the courage to be great. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Receive the word of God today. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that this word seed will grow up and bear forth much good fruit. I decree and declare that the wicked one would not steal the word that was sowed, but we thank you, Father God, that great things will come from this. I thank you, Lord, that new ideas, new thoughts, Father God, will come from this, that there will be no more low self-esteem and low self-worth. I bind every spirit that would try to come against the people of God, that would cause them to think thoughts of low self-image and and of insignificance, Father, that we are created in your image, in your likeness. We are joint heirs together with Jesus Christ. We are seated in heavenly places together with him. I thank you, Lord, that because of that, because we are your child and your children, you call us royalty. We are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. Let us never think down upon ourselves or about ourselves or speak bad about ourselves. But let us speak those good things that you speak, what you say. Lord, correct our thoughts here this morning that we will understand that we have what it takes to do what you've called us to do, that there's greater inside of us, that the greater one lives inside of us, and that we will do great things in this life. In Jesus' name. Close your eyes with me for just a moment. And just let this word resonate. Just take a moment. I'd like to take just a few moments to be introspective. Don't think about what this word means for Mike or Sally. Think about what it means for you. The word benefits you when it's mixed with faith after you hear it. So what is God speaking to you to do? By faith now. Correcting some things you've been saying. Maybe some ways that you've been thinking. Maybe it's your perspective or 
Maybe God is speaking to you, confirming that it's time to step out. I have good news, though. God is with you. You're never alone. But maybe some of you have felt so alone. Felt so alone lately. You felt like it's just you by yourself. And part of that loneliness and that emptiness might come because you don't have real relationship with God. I'm not talking about you going to church or being a good person, but there's a void, there's an emptiness, there's a loneliness that keeps lingering. And it's because, friend, you don't have relationship with God. And because of that lack of relationship with God, nothing can fill that void. Nothing can satisfy. You might go to parties and and drink, and that doesn't satisfy. You might look online and try to do some things, that doesn't satisfy. Different relationships and different jobs don't satisfy. The things of this world, cars and, and purchases, trips, they didn't satisfy. There's only one thing that can satisfy. That's a relationship with God because you were designed for a relationship with Him. If you're here today and you know that you don't have that relationship with God, but you'd like it, the most important thing that I can do today is share with you the one fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And on the third day, He rose again. He is alive today. And he wants to take up residence in your heart. He wants to reside right with you. He wants to be with you. He wants relationship with you. He wants to give your life new meaning and purpose and fill that void once and for all. If you're here today and you know that's you who I'm talking to, allow me the pleasure of praying a prayer with you of salvation to fill that void, to give you new hope and start a relationship with God here today. If that's you, I want you to take courage and take that boldness that I talked about and get up out of your seat, make your way into the aisle and stand up here with me at this altar and allow me to pray with you here today. If that's you, come forward right now. I know it takes courage, but I don't want to leave you out. This is what I came for. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Or perhaps you might be in a second group of people. Praise God. Come forward. Perhaps you might be in a second group of people who has had relationship with God. At one point, you're walking with God, but now you're feeling this distance from God. You're feeling like You don't know when the last time God and you all have communed. The last time God has spoken to you, you've spoken to Him. You're feeling like you and God have fallen fallen out of relationship with each other. And that joy that you once had, that relationship you once had, that freedom you once had, you slip back into old ways, bondage. And you're trying to find God once again. You might have been even praying recently, saying, God, I need your help again, and I know I've messed up, and it's made you feel ashamed, ashamed on turning your back on what you knew to be the truth, is that God is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And the good thing is, is that he didn't give his life for perfect people. He gave his life for imperfect people people who know that they need a Savior. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and he despised the shame because he was up there being tortured naked on a cross, died publicly, but he endured the shame for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. The joy was seeing you coming home. You don't have to feel ashamed if you've gone astray. And you need to come back home. Come back, brother. Please, come back, sister. Come back home. I'll give a few more moments because I don't want to leave you out. That's you who I'm talking to. Please come up to the altar and let's pray here today together. 
Is there anybody else? I don't want to leave you out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. My friends who have come up here to this altar, I want you to raise both hands to the Lord. And I want you to just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say this, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. You know my life and you know how I've lived. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, he rose again. Now, Lord, I ask you, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. From this day forward, my life belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give them a big hand clap to encourage them. This is the beginning of a new start. The beginning of something new. That's great news, great news, great news. Praise God. I know it takes courage to say that prayer, especially doing it publicly, but Jesus died for us publicly. So I believe that we can declare and proclaim his name publicly. Amen. Amen. And so we thank you so much for responding to the call. If there's some extra instructions that you need, I'm sure the, the staff here uh, and the pastors will, uh, will give you that next set of instructions. I love you so much, and I thank you for allowing me to share with you this morning. Uh, you can find me on social media. I would love to connect with you all. Some of you all already follow me on social media, and it's a great thing. Durban and South Africa as a whole is like a second home to me. I love being here. I love it. I, I love it. And I'm not just saying that. I don't say that everywhere I go. I'm not in Kenya being like, oh, this is my second home. <laughs> really, South Africa holds a special place in my heart. Such beautiful people, such great culture, and the Spirit of God is so heavy here. You all are so hungry, and I love it. And you all embrace us as one of your own, and we thank you so much. Um, you can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at David S. Winston, David S. Winston. Um, and also, I have just a small handful of books uh, available in the back. You can purchase those today if you would like. Authentic, The Courage to Release Your Greatness. Uh, the confidence to be yourself, the courage to release your greatness. Um, and I believe that it's really going to bless you. Some of what I talked about today comes right out of that book. Uh, if we sell out, I promise we'll get some more to our BWM Africa office, which is right here in Durban. And so you can go to billwinston.org.za to place your order for your copy online. If we do sell out, my apologies. The book has done very well in the other spots. And so I, but I did tell them to hold some for you all. Uh, so you can uh, be blessed by that. Thank you for those hand claps. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I love you all, and I love your leaders. Um, I want to let you know that you have fantastic leadership. Uh, I honor the Watsons um, in their absence. I know they're uh, having a great time where they are, uh, and I honor you all as the next generation. Um, and I want to let you know, Pastor Josh, you're doing a great job. And you, leadership, you all are doing a great job. Continue to do what you've done. And, um, you know, I know sometimes it can be challenging to take over as a second-generation leader, not that I know anything about it. Um, but I do know that God's hand is on you and that the Spirit of God is on you and that you will be Spirit-led. And church, I want to encourage you, continue to pray for your leaders. Really. And I'll say it as a group. We need your prayers because, you know, things get challenging for us too. You know, we have feelings, too. We have, a, some of us have a family, too. <laughs> and, and, you know, things happen. Life doesn't change and all of a sudden get sunshine and rainbows and roses because you go into the ministry. You know, you're challenged just as well. But there's a greater call of responsibility because you not only have to manage your challenges, but then you have to be there with courage, compassion, and wisdom to help other people navigate their challenges as well. And sometimes that can be a heavy cross to bear. And I'm not here to complain. God has given us strength to do it because it is the call to which we've been given. But I'm here to tell you, church, it matters and makes a difference when you pray for your leaders. So continue to encourage them. No matter how strong you think your leader is, always encourage them. Always give your testimony to them. Always pray for them. Because let me tell you, we need it and we're encouraged by it. Thank you all. I love you all so much. Thank you for receiving me. God bless you. Keep walking by faith. I'm going to take up the offering really quickly. 
and I won't take too much time, but I'm going to read from Luke chapter 12, verse 22 to 34, and I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to point out portions of it. In verse 22, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Verse 25, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are able, not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? In verse 29, Do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink. Do not be worried. Verse 31, Instead, seek the kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And the reason that I'm pointing out this passage of Scripture, and you can go and read it for yourself in Luke chapter 12, 22 to 34. You know it well inside church. So um, I was in Amphalosi, Amphalosi Game Reserve yesterday in Shlutluwe, not Shlutluwe. I told the Zulu person I'm going to Shlutluwe. They're like, to where? To Shlutluwe. No, there's no way. Oh, Shlutluwe. Yeah, okay. I got you. Um, and um, I was driving around and I was looking at the animals and things like that. And fortunately for us, Jesus actually uses animals. He uses sparrows. Um, as an analogy in this case. And we don't have, we don't really care too much about the sparrows, but we do have, we do have other game animals that walk around the game reserve. And I was literally thinking this because I always do the offering message, so I'm always thinking about offering. And um, I'm watching these animals, and I was like, you know, it's not fair. Uh, Lord, these oaks don't have to work for their food. They just walk around, and they eat, and it just like grows, and then they eat it, and it grows, and they eat it, and they don't have to go to work in the morning, wake up at eight, you know, use their Colgate, get dressed nicely, go work, do all this stuff. They just keep eating, and that's all they do, just eat all day and carry on with their existence, and I was like, that's not fair, and the Lord spoke to my heart about the sparrows. Who feeds them? your father. And I was like, sure. Jesus uses the analogy, are you not much more valuable than them? And I think a lot about Jesus' entire point here is don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Because you're more valuable than them. And when we believe that we are more valuable than the animals that He created, that don't strive, don't worry, they're not stressed, the next bush, that bush is empty, they just move to the next bush, and they just make their way along. We're so much more valuable than they are, and yet your Father feeds them. And I don't think we believe that about God. I don't think in our heart of hearts, there's many of us, I'm preaching to myself, that when the road gets tough, do I believe that my Father is going to feed me? Because I'm so much more valuable than they. Or am I afraid about what might come? And so I toil and I come up with plans and I come up with solutions and I come up with striving and efforts to try and make sure that I mitigate my risk and ensure that I don't ever have to face the thing that I fear, which is having nothing. That's what I'm really afraid of, to be in lack, to be in despair, to be impoverished. And Jesus is saying, you can't add anything to your life and if you cannot do a little thing like that, what's the point about worrying about the rest? You have so much more value. And I love Jesus' compassion in verse 32. He says, fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. You can hear him being compassionate. Fear not, little flock. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. Amen. Are you ready to give and watch some announcements?
Thank you for watching. Join us again next week to stay in touch with all that God is doing at Inside Church.